and welcome to yet another exciting episode of Skeptics and Seekers. I'm your host, David the Skeptic, and I'm joined by Brian with a Y. Does he keep doing this show with me? How you doing, Brian? Well, you keep inviting me, and uh, you know, I don't have the... <laughs> I don't have the heart to say no, so here I am, back at it. Well, uh, well, um, I can I can list about ten people uh, who have had the heart recently to say no to me. Um, <laughs> I get a lot of no's, uh, but I keep asking. Uh, good to have you on. Uh, just before we get started, by the way, in case you guys don't know, I know you longtime listeners know when when Brian and I are on the show alone, it's a comment section show. Uh, that's what it is. We're going to go back in time and we're going to look at some of the great uh, discussions that we have had since the last comment show. Uh, and uh, we're going to highlight some of the things that uh, we found interesting or um, inflammatory or <laughs> something that caught our eye and was worthy of comment. Things that uh, maybe we wish we had had time to talk about, uh, maybe things that we want to hang a lantern on. Uh, and have some more conversation about. And so uh, listen for your name or handle. Uh, you might be in it. Uh, I just wanted to make a, a quick uh, comment before we uh, got straight into it. Uh, I, wanted, I just want to take a, a moment to call out the people who participate on the show as contributors, as show contributors. Uh, this is a hard thing to do. And... Uh, it's easy to take it for granted. I I use my uh, commenters as guest hosts, and I would love for everybody uh, to have a turn on the mic and let the world get to know them a little bit, and let's get to know each other a little bit uh, in in some way besides um, text, because that's a, that's a very hard way. Uh, to get to know people, especially on uh, emotionally charged issues. And so uh, I I bring people on and they're crazy enough to agree and they come on and they realize, you know what, this isn't really easy. <laughs> it's not easy. And we try to make it as easy as possible and as fun as possible. But I just want to take a moment to give some appreciations and, and love to the people who come on uh, and make this happen. I mean, some of us started doing it at the same time and it wasn't that long ago. And it's not like we knew what we were doing when we started. So um, uh, Andrew uh, and I started uh, podcasting uh, around the same time, uh, and we realized that we couldn't get along, and so we, <laughs> we went our separate ways, and we still end up on each other's shows all the time. Um, and then Matt uh, uh, was with us uh, there, and he's uh, just kind of the referee. He uh, does shows with uh, Andrew, and then he comes and does shows with me, and so he, uh, uh, you know, he's <laughs> he's a very patient uh, and a thoughtful fellow who makes this podcasting thing look easy. Um, it's not as easy as he makes it look. Uh, but we really appreciate Matt uh, because he's he's one that you can call on at the last minute. And he always has something uh, really interesting uh, and thoughtful to say. Uh, I want to thank uh, some of the people who um, maybe don't come on as often. Val uh, has... Uh, uh, graced the airways, and uh, he's he's a little bit mic shy, but he's uh, one of the smartest people I know. Thanks, Val, uh, for doing that, and I think that we'll have you on at least one more time uh, before this season is over. Stay tuned. Um, we've got a number of Christians uh, who uh, have been on the show. I want to especially uh, give a shout out to uh, Teddy. Teddy, when she first came. Uh, to the podcast. I think she came over uh, because of some of the Shroud uh, conversations, and uh, her first few comments on the podcast uh, were with me, and we clashed. Oh, did we? Um, I didn't like her very much, and she didn't like me, and so I had to get to know her better. <laughs> that's that's my reaction to people that I don't like. I got to talk to them again. Uh, and so uh, we interacted some more, and uh, she agreed to come on the show, and she's been a mainstay since then. And while we agree on almost nothing, uh, I, it, she puts herself at a great deal of uh, conversational risk uh, by coming on in hostile territory and defending her ground, and that's much appreciated. We need more people who are, are willing to 
uh, say what they think uh, in, in a way that other people can listen and have a chance to interact with their beliefs. In the same way, uh, I want to call out Marvin, uh, who is uh, one of our uh, mods on the board. And uh, Marvin and I have had a history of not getting along <laughs> for a long time. Uh, but uh, we have uh, we've had some great conversations, and uh, I hope to have uh, Marvin on the show uh, before this season ends. Uh, is over, uh, and so I could I could keep going, uh, but you know these people are people who make the show what it is. And yes, we get people on the show with um, terminal uh, degrees, um, doctors, multiple doctorates, um, very very academically inclined, accomplished people, and I enjoy talking to them. But honestly, I like talking to you guys the most. Uh, and if I had to do a show that had only one thing or the other, it either had all academic guests or all lay people, I, I choose the lay people every time. Uh, you guys make the show happen. You make it great. And uh, I very much appreciate it. This is this is why I do it. And so uh, it wouldn't be a comment, comment section without Brian, and it wouldn't be a comment section without you guys. And so with that... Let's dive into some of the conversations. I doubt that we'll make it uh, through everything on our list, but uh, we're going to give it a good college try. Brian, you get the first bite of the apple. Fantastic. And I uh, just wanted to echo your sentiments about the community, how they're not only just writing text on the boards, but coming on the shows as well. And I agree. I think that makes it very rich and very engaging. And I am happy to be both a spectator and a gladiator in that effect. So thank you for having me as always. Let me start with a comment from one of the more recent shows, The Children of God. And this is a comment from B. Blair. That's the handle. Uh, and uh, I really enjoyed this comment, uh, and that's why I picked it. So he wrote, um, hello, I haven't joined in the comments before, but I have enjoyed the show. This one hit a particular nerve for me, I think. My parents could have said a lot of the things being said by David P. I wasn't raised in a particularly strict environment or one that denied science or discouraged questions. My parents acknowledged that we are all sinners, but also told me I was a good person. Christian beliefs were taught to me from a young age, and I took them seriously, and it was incredibly damaging for me. I felt that I was deeply flawed, that I deserved hell, and that I would go there if I didn't follow Jesus. From a very young age, I actively worked to destroy my ego and embrace a less of me, more of you relationship with God. I received a lot of accolades for being such a devoted follower. As an adult who left Christianity many years ago, I am still trying to unravel the psychological damage. I know many other people who share a similar story. I'd also like to acknowledge that I know people with similar upbringings who feel positively about it. Sometimes these people are in the same family. I think maybe my point is that I feel these are very dangerous ideas to feed a child without knowing how they will respond. And that is something we simply cannot know. While it's true that there are some who will skate through it, there are others who simply will not. And I absolutely count myself among those in the second group. And I very much wish that I had been spared this kind of light indoctrination as a child. You know, when I, when I first read that comment, um, it, sparked in me the desire to do a show that I had thought about doing almost since the beginning of SNS. And I'm fairly convinced that I'll get to it this season. Uh, and that show would be uh, a round table of exgens, as I like to call them, uh, us, I should say, and talk about some of the damage religion has done to us. This is, a, this is something that uh, I don't talk about much and I don't think we talk about much because it's very personal. It's one thing to say Christianity can cause a lot of psychological damage. But I think that Christians don't really know what we mean. And uh, I think that we should probably be a little bit more specific. Uh, and so I want to do a show and I want to uh, write uh, maybe a more substantial piece about some of the psychological damage that I've gone through. 
and uh, if I can get a few others to talk about their personal experiences that they've gone through and some of those lasting effects, because I, I can tell you, there is psychological damage and there are lasting effects. I'm never going to shake some of them. Uh, and I, I think that's true for uh, a, a lot of people in this community. And I think that that is a part of the story that Christians simply don't understand. Absolutely. I 100% agree. Uh, I picked this comment for a couple of reasons. One, for someone who doesn't uh, write on the boards very much, what an amazingly personal and deep and you know thought-provoking thing to share about their, uh, their personal history. Uh, so I really, really appreciate you putting this uh, down and writing, B. Blair. Uh, and I'm also glad that what it does is shows that a lot of these topics, when you're talking about them on these internet debates and forums, they're largely academic. Uh, and I think this just shows how real world some of these things um, bump into. Uh, and it's always good to, to highlight that these aren't just academic discussions. They have real people in them with real emotions and real hurt. Uh, so, so I think that's a, a, a something that was really needed to be seen. So B. Blair, I'm going to uh, make you the first invitee uh, to that show. I don't know how to reach you, so I hope you're listening. Uh, write me an email at skepticsandseekers at gmail.com. And uh, if there's anyone else uh, out there who'd like to uh, be on that show that uh, I just talked about, um, send me an email to the same uh, email. Just drop me a note. We'll uh, we'll chat. Skeptics and Seekers at gmail dot com. Thanks so much, um, uh, B, for uh, for that post. Uh, I'm going to uh, pick one up. I. <laughs> I did a copy and paste job and I forgot to put what shows <laughs> they came <laughs> from. So, um, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> it's one of the shows a few <laughs> weeks ago. <laughs> um, but uh, Cosmic Debris. Cosmic Debris. First of all, um, I picked this uh, post because uh, I thought it was interesting and also because uh, your username is Cosmic Debris. Um, <laughs> really, that's reason enough. Uh, Hitchens Razor is an epistemological razor expressed by writer Christopher Hitchens. It says that the burden of proof, truthfulness of a claim, lies with the one uh, who makes the claim. If this burden is not met, then the claim is unfounded and its opponents need not argue further uh, in order to dismiss it. Hitchens has phrased the razor in writing as, what can be asserted without evidence can also be dismissed without evidence. Thank you, Mr. Debris, if that's your real One name. Second. Okay, Oops. I found this on the web. For a uh, very, <laughs> thank you, Siri. Okay. I've probably got um, probably seven objects in this room. <laughs> Siri. Um, that's embarrassing. It's I, like that, uh, I like that your Siri uh, identifies with cosmic debris. I think that's kind of interesting. <laughs> yeah. It's probably going to happen again. Um, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, Hitchens Razor is one that um, I don't actually think gets an, enough credit today. Um, that which can be asserted without evidence uh, can also be dismissed without evidence. Now, it's trite, uh, but true. However, the reason I don't use it uh, a lot is because I'm a podcaster, and uh, I run a discussion board, and my goal is to talk to people who believe different things, not to shut down conversations uh, with who uh, people who believe different things. And so this is a good conversational ender, you know, uh, but <laughs> it doesn't, it doesn't really <laughs> promote um, conversation beyond that. Uh, because if what you determined is that the Christian doesn't have any valid evidence and you simply say, well, you know, I can dismiss it without evidence. See ya. <laughs> you weren't really <laughs> trying to have a conversation. So, but the next the next debate you're in, David, literally the only thing you should say in response is Hitchens razor. Hitchens razor. <laughs> next question. 
uh, I tell you, as the seasons roll on, uh, I feel like doing that more, <laughs> more and more often. Um, I am sure. I am sure. One, th one thing about Hitchens Razor, I think, gets misunderstood, particularly by those that are lobbying the claim without evidence to start the process, is they misunderstand that what's being said is not that whatever you have claimed can be dismissed because it's possible that you make a claim that is true. But the point is, if you don't provide evidence for it, then I, as the listener, don't have to move forward with analyzing the claim until you bring forth the evidence. I'm not saying the claim is false. I'm not right. saying that you, you've done something in error by bringing up this topic. It's if you're going to make a claim, it's to me, that's meaningless until you bring the evidence. Right. Right. Um, the other the other thing that um, caught my eye about this uh, quote is it was a, in a conversation that I think a conversation spun off of this about the burden of proof. And we often hear burden of proof, proof uh, arguments. And I just wanted to um, repeat one thing that I've said uh, from time to time, but not often enough. Um, I believe that Christians, especially ap apologists, uh, get weary of the position. They get a little bit tired of being on defense all the time. And they need to find a way to put the other side on uh, a defensive position. And so they're looking for ways to trap uh, skeptics into making a claim so they can say, aha, you've made a claim. Now you have to prove it. Um, I, I think this is fallacious. Uh, now, in a strictly uh, conversational, philosophical uh, gentleman is agreement type thing. Maybe it's not fallacious, but I think in the grand scheme of what is true and what is false, it is fallacious. And the reason is because the conversation is by its nature uh, a Christian claim. So go back to the beginning of human conversations. The conversation did not start off uh, with one caveman uh, looking at another caveman and saying, you know what? I don't think there's a God. <laughs> That's not how the conversation started. Uh, the conversation would have started something like one caveman is looking up at the sky, he's seeing a volcano, and he says, you know, I think that, I think, you know, they might be spirits. <laughs> you know, the claim, the initial claim that kicks off the conversation universally is the claim that there is a God and that God is doing things in the world. Uh, and that, you know, this bled over to the politics of ancient times. You know, we're going to feed this volcano, uh, your virgin daughter. Uh, why, well, why are we doing that? We're not doing that because of the people who say there is no God. <laughs> we're doing that because of the people who say there is a God. The conversation by its nature, the claim is always the Christian claim. It does not matter if today atheists are responding to that claim and make some kind of counterclaim. The counterclaim is irrelevant. We are always responding to the initial Christian claim. And so we never have the burden of proof. The burden of proof, if Christians want to make their religion stick and make it a part of our politics and make it a part of our culture and make it, a, then you are making the claim and you have to defend it. Uh, now, once again, I run a, a discussion board and a podcast. So I don't mind taking on some burden of proof that isn't really mine to take, but make no mistake about it, I don't have any uh, requirement to take on any burden of proof. No skeptic does, because that's not how this conversation works. Uh, and I assure you, if Christians stopped making the claim that there was a God, if they stopped trying to shoehorn God in education in every aspect of life, atheists would stop. We, we would simply stop. <laughs> that would be the end of the conversation. We are always responding to the Christian claim. So um, there you go. Uh, that ran into some controversy the first time I said it. I hope it stirs up as much controversy this time. Um, and I will say it again before the season's over. I've got I've got your back on this one. So we're, we're copacetic. All right. Uh, number two, I think from you, we've got a person that I didn't mention earlier, Mac Attack. He has been on the show exactly one time, and I have been wanting him to come on the show again. When he does comment, uh, he comments 
own topic uh, with quotes uh, and with a lot of uh, critique, <laughs> sometimes I find <laughs> questionable, uh, but he's one of the best uh, on topic uh, responders uh, that we've had on the show. And I, I've gotten into it a little bit, a little bit uh, and I had him on the show, and I thoroughly enjoyed having him on the show. And if you're listening, Mac, I actually want to have you on the show again. Uh, it just hasn't been the right opportunity. But I want to thank you for coming on uh, when you did, and I hope you're willing to do so again. And we can we can uh, deal with some of your responses in person because I, I just didn't have the time when you came on last, and you had a lot of responses to a lot of things. And I I was snowed under, and so I, I wanted. Uh, I'm glad that you're highlighted here in the show, and uh, we'll have you on again. Uh, go ahead. Um, go ahead, Brian. Yep. Sure. Um, so Mac attack says, um, he's quoting here, quoting another poster, consider what they are being asked to do at a tender age. They're being asked to die for them, die to themselves, sacrifice everything for Jesus, take vows of sexual purity, give some portion of every penny they make for the rest of their lives to the church, be a witness for God and much more all before they turn 10. In many cases, this is what it is to be a Christian. And why is any of that legal for children who are not of the legal age to do anything? And then Mac responds, that's a lot, there's a lot wrong in this paragraph. There's your, I was pointing to Mac's uh, acuity there. Uh, but one thing that sticks out is how everything is being presented as a negative somehow ought to be a positive. Let's see how this paragraph sounds if it's flipped around. Consider what they're being asked to do at such a tender age. They're being asked to not die to themselves, not sacrifice everything for Jesus, not take vows of sexual purity, not give some portion of every penny they make for the rest of their lives to the church, not be a witness for God and much more all before they turn 10 in many cases, etc. Uh, this is what it is to be a secular atheist. Why is any of that legal for children who are not of legal age to do anything? What is the solution here? How does one raise their children to fit you into your subjective definition of non indoctrination? Uh, again, he's quoting it shouldn't be. I think referring to the legality and Mac responds based on what? You're simply giving your opinion to the podcast in the article, but how does your subjective opinion suddenly become obje uh, absolute objective should? Now, I picked this one for two reasons. One, um, I think it, sh this, it shows one of the big, big issues I have with all of these conversations, and it's a false dichotomy. Uh, the point is not, this is what we should teach our kids and it's the opposite of what you're saying we should teach our kids. I would contend that a lot of those topics that he's quoting in the paragraph are things that no 10 year old should have to weigh in on one way or the other. They're not ready. They're not old enough. They're not mature enough. So it's not a matter of give to the church or don't give to the church, be sexually pure or be sexually impure. It's let's not burden 10 year olds with such weighty topics until they're older and more ready. Yes, and as the person who he's quoting, I have some thoughts. <laughs> I, I would imagine you did. Before you get to your thoughts, I just wanted, I wanted to real quick just echo what you said. Mac Attack, please come back on the show. I'm pretty sure you guys did almost a, two, a four hour two-parter when you guys yeah. did the show. I mean, yeah, and I, I listened to every second fair. riveted. It was amazing. So please, Mac, yeah, come back. We want to hear more from you. He's, he's great uh, on podcasts. And so um, I, I, really, I really do like him. Uh, but I think this is maybe the worst argument I've ever heard. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm happy to I'm happy to tee you up. So get out the driver. <laughs> so, and, I, and and just to be clear, not all of his arguments are clunkers. Okay, uh, not all of my arguments are great. Not all of his arguments are bad. But this was bad uh, to me. <laughs> uh, but I would say um, the thing that strikes me uh, after the quotations is. What's the solution here? Um, this is this is where the dialogue begins. Uh, so I don't know what the solution is, uh, Mac. Uh, there's there's going to be some more uh, from this show, uh, and so I'll hold some of my powder for uh, a future comment. But uh, how does one raise their children to fit into uh, my subjective? definition of none indoctrination i don't know uh mac i really don't i i have pieces 
of answers. I don't have the entire answers, but one of the pieces of answers uh, is to not burden uh, your child with your uh, psychological baggage or your religious baggage or your sexual baggage uh, or any of your baggage that children shouldn't have. And you say, tell my child that what I believe. Well, of course you can. But, um, you know, if you are, if, if you are a gun nut, you know, it, there may be some benefit in making sure your kids know how to handle a gun properly at some point. But at what point do you start raising your children with, with a gun in their hand? What age is that? I mean, that it, this is a kind of an age appropriate conversation uh, where, where the age really does matter. Uh, sexuality is um, an important topic. Uh, parents need to have uh, serious and real conversations about sexuality. But, you know, if you've, if you've got some kind of weird, you know, um, if you're a freak, <laughs> you know, um, it, no, no judgment uh, to us freaks. Um, but if that's, if that's your thing, uh, and, and you got some kind of weird thing that goes along with that, you, you don't have to share that with your kids. <laughs> Honestly, uh, you, you believe it, you love it, you live it, but you don't have to make that a part of your kid's life. And, uh, I, I say this to say that if, if you are a, a believer in God or Zeus or the devil or whatever it is you worship, you can still do that without dragging your kids into that and making them feel like this is also something that they have to do. We have all kinds of buckets for age appropriate things that we bring our kids into at certain points in their life. And I think that religion should be one of those. Now, if you're looking for a more specific answer than that, I don't have one, uh, but I think that's a place where dialogue can begin. Absolutely, hundred percent. And and in his sign off, again, there's this move that if you proffer some sort of position to take on these topics, that what you're proffering is absolute, objective, capital T truth, right? It, it's this all or nothing thought process, right? Whereas maybe I don't have an absolute, objective, capital T truth position on any of these topics, but I have a evidenced, better than otherwise position to share. Uh, I should be able to share that and share that with the proper caveats and with the proper evidence and not if I don't have some from on high truth, I can't speak to these issues. I, I just think that's crazy. So you you actually said a thing that I had cut from my um, <laughs> plan to say I was going to move on without the rant, but you you pushed me. <laughs> I, I did it. I, I tipped you over. You're the domino. Yeah, the domino I was I was about to move on, man. Um, <laughs> I dragged, so. Right. <laughs> you're like, so you're like, you're like Pacino in The Godfather. You thought you were out, but I pulled you back in. I, I, I keep getting pulled in. Uh, <laughs> this, this objective morality um, idea that underpins uh, some of this uh, comment, it, it seems uh, very strange to me. So, uh, no, I'm a, I'm a subjectionist. Uh, right. I, I, I don't believe uh, in objective morality. Uh, but that said, as a subjectivist, I get to focus on something like human well-being and I can negotiate uh, with my fellow humans uh, to uh, agree upon things that are uh, good for well-being and bad for well-being. And we will not always agree, but as, as a species, we have been negotiating this for ages. And every society, almost every society on the planet is way better than it was, say, a thousand years ago, <laughs> even a hundred years ago, because we continue that negotiation. Um, and one, one might think that if we continue the negotiation a hundred, two hundred, a thousand years in the future, uh, we will be much closer to this singularity of, uh, of social 
peace uh, that I think that we all long for. But if you say, well, no, I get my marching orders from God, well, you've got a problem there. Uh, because one, you can't negotiate with God. There's no negotiation uh, to work to toward what is best for human flourishing. It's just whatever God says. Second, to interpret what it is God wants. I don't know what God wants. I've read the Bible more times than you, uh, in all likelihood, whoever you are listening. I have no idea what God wants. Uh, and so it requires someone who is extremely spiritual to be able to understand what God wants and then tell everyone else what God wants. So here, we God has this objective morality that can't be uh, properly communicated, and we can't negotiate it, uh, with it. I'll take my subjective uh, negotiation of uh, social and uh, ethical well-being any day over the mess that the Christians give us. I am not sorry that I uh, influenced that rant coming into play. <laughs> I... I, I, just, I was it was cut, but there it is. Uh, Paul Burton, uh, Paul Burton. I don't I think, it's, think I, think it's I have. Oh, Boston. Boston. I'm sorry, yeah. Paul Boston. Uh, I don't think that I've had any communication with Paul, um, and yet I don't think he's entirely new to the uh, comments. So uh, like it says, I've listen. Him, I've, yeah, I was. Yeah, I think I've seen him around, but I, he doesn't post that much, though. So. Right. Um, lis listening to the podcast and reading David's blog has made me realize how atheists can have a vastly different uh, uh, impression of the Bible. I attended a primary school where we were uh, read to from a big book of Old Testament stories and a big book of Greek myths. They might have been stories from the Iliad. It never occurred to me that people would uh, have thought just one of these sets of stories was real and actually happened. If I'd had a chance uh, of God, oh, I'm sorry, if I had to choose a God from those books, it would probably have been Apollo. Jupiter uh, was old and Mercury didn't uh, look tough enough. Later, <laughs> right, later. Uh, I mean, if you're going to choose a God, I mean, this, I guess this is good criteria. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that, that's that's some solid missionary work right there well yeah done. no uh so i don't think joe pesci would make the list uh for, <laughs> for Paul. um it's a man who can get things done <laughs> later uh we got new testament stories too jesus and his disciples seemed a bit more real i knew people believed jesus traveled around telling parables and uh sorting out lepers but it never occurred to me that the miracles might be real. I had friends from Christian families, but I assumed when Christians taught stories from the Bible, they didn't really actually believe them. Eventually, I discovered that there are millions of Christians around the world who believe all the Bible stories all of the time, and probably even more who believe most of them some of the time. Once in a while, a Christian shows up who doesn't believe most of the stories a lot of the time, and that's quite reassuring. So, um, so uh, <clears throat> Paul, I come from a uh, part of the world where we believed all of the stories all of the time. <laughs> you would have been most disturbed, <laughs> I think, uh, by that. Uh, this is uh, this comment caught my eye because uh, you know we talked to a, a lot of different uh, flavors of, of Christians. Uh, on the show. And um, the ones who are most progressive, they annoy me in a particular way. Uh, Peter, I'm looking at you. We'll get to you. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, in the queue. One of the one of the ways they annoy me is that they insist that this this kind of fundamentalist uh, way of looking at the Bible is this thing that is so niche it's, it's just a small cult-like group that has nothing to do with real christianity brother that is just not true <laughs> that is so not 
true. And it feels insulting and denigrating um, when progressives talk like that, as if to say, oh, you, you poor fellow, bless your heart. You just grew up in the wrong family. No, I didn't. <laughs> no. And you were the one who's being somewhat, I think, disingenuous and maybe gaslighting um, us into trying to suggest, oh, no. he believes that women should be submissive to men. Shut up. <laughs> yeah, yes, they do. Oh, nobody believes that all of these Bible stories are little. Shut up. <laughs> yes, they do. Uh, and so I, I do understand and appreciate that that is not all of Christendom, but it's a huge part of it. And to pretend like it's not, um, it just kind of denies the experience of so many of us who come from different parts of the country and different parts of the world with the same story. Yeah, I agree. Um, that said, yeah, uh, I, I also I like you. It's OK. I'm don't don't worry about me. I'm okay. <laughs> But it, but it, it's it's good to to hear different perspectives, right? I mean, the, the more the more that one particular view gets echoed, then it 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 seems to be more prevalent than it is. So we absolutely want to be hearing from different perspectives of what um, they were as Christians or thought uh, Christianity was or perceived it to be around them. I, I think that's important information to get out. Right, I I do too, and I. I appreciate that, and I actually do like talking to uh, progressives because that's a very different kind of conversation. But it is, you know, the ones that I most enjoy talking to are the ones who do acknowledge um, that they are they are a the minority and b um, that they have somewhat non-standard beliefs. You know, some of the extreme progressive views are not standard. They are a part of what you would consider Christian beliefs, but it's the smaller part, and it's and it's somewhat idiosyncratic. So that said, um, that's my rant. Um, your turn. Excellent. So my next comment is from the superhero show, uh, which was very interesting. Thanks for doing that with your crew. Um, and this is a comment from Brian with an I, who is my almost brother from another mother, but he's just missing that one important piece, as always. Yeah, Brian, thanks. Your name. I, <laughs> I've been trying to do a search to see what the most common spelling of this is. I'm not sure which one of you is misspelling your name, but one of you is. Yes, and we're going to have it out in a, in a death match before this whole thing is all said and done. Uh, but for now, we will coexist. And thanks again, Brian. Always, always like getting into conversations with you on the boards. Uh, and on this comment, uh, he and I were actually conversing, and he writes, uh, Hi, Brian. I fully agree that just because something has value does not necessarily point to God existing. Oh, I'm so happy to see this written down in, in words. Oh, it makes me so happy. Anyway, I can, he continues. I would also fully agree that in many, most, question mark, cases, we cannot be sure what the intent was of any particular author. I think it can be nice to know the author's intent, but I'm not so sure it is always critical. For example, for me, I'm not so sure what the author of Don Quixote intended his readers to get out of the book is all that is, I'm sorry, intended his readers to get out of the book is all that is important. What is important to me is what I get out of the book. And just because I get things out of Don Quixote that the author didn't intend doesn't mean I'm wrong or right, does it? It just means that the author and I are different. Brian, if I indicated that I knew that what the intent was of the author of the fig leaf story from the Bible, when, uh, then I apologize. I should only have indicated what I got out of it, what I've heard others have gotten out of it. Glad for the feedback, Brian, with an I. Uh, and I picked this comment because I thought this was a really interesting conversation. Uh, like I said, Brian, and I have had several uh, in this vein, and, and I just wanted to, to grab one of the comments from that thread uh, because it was in the vein of talking about the Bible as literature. Uh, and I've said before a hundred times that, you know, we, we can certainly talk about the Bible as literature. The problem is, is at the end of that conversation, no matter where we land, it's not going to get you to God existing. It's not going to get you to Jesus being a deity that resurrected from the dead. So it's an interesting conversation to discuss the Bible as literature. But as he says in the first comment, just because 
any story in the in the Bible that is an allegory or a myth or a, a legend or a teaching parable. Great, we can you know we can analyze those things for what they are, but they don't in any way point to God. You can have any of these kinds of stories without there being an actual deity. So I think what happens is then there's this equivocation fallacy, kind of a la the Jordan Peterson, because something's useful, therefore it's true, and then you take true mm -hmm. and flip the meaning to, and therefore it's true that you know Jesus cursed the fig leaf when it was out of season, uh, which you know, I think as I wrote to someone else in the thread uh, earlier, uh, that that makes Jesus a loon. <laughs> so uh, yeah, I just, I, I, I find those conversations interesting until the equivocation flip happens and then I end up getting frustrated. So I'm glad that you um, chose this comment uh, as well. I, I don't know if I was in this particular conversation, but I've been in this uh, conversation on this subject. Uh, with Brian, and he is so infuriating to me. <laughs> Look, um, right, Brian, he has this way about him. Um, you know, it's he, he's so he, he, genteel. Yeah, it's it's like he's got this um, iron fist covered up with a you know a, a nice soft plushy glove with bunny ears. Um, I see I see you, Brian. Um, I see through that. Uh, but this is what this is why it's infuriating to me. Um, yes, Brian, you are wrong. You ask if you're wrong. You are wrong. Uh, it does matter what the author intended. You I'm sorry, the Bible is not Don Quixote. Uh, or at least that's not how it's being presented, all right? And so how it's being presented and what the author wanted it to be does matter. It actually does matter. Even in poetry, uh, it matters. You can't. It, poetry is not just something that you can serve up and say it means anything you want to, as if it were some kind of um, word salad Rorschach test. That's not what proper poetry is. Poetry actually says something. And you might have to take a minute to figure out what it is. And it may have layers of double and triple entendre, and you might uh, work through that. And so it might uh, be true on a number of levels, but it does say something. For instance, a, a poem uh, that is a thousand lines long might ultimately be saying, I love you. Well, you don't get to go to that poem and say, well, hmm, I read it and it seems to say, I hate you. So I'm going to take that <laughs> as the message. No, that's not the message. You're wrong. <laughs> it absolutely does matter uh, what the author says. And maybe uh, I have some sensitive to this because, uh, uh, because I, I write for a living. Uh, and I actually want people to know what I meant. Uh, part of the writing that I do, because I don't write poetry, uh, part of the writing I do, it's very straightforward. Uh, there's a message, uh, there's some advice, um, and people need to know what that is. And if they come away with a different message than what I was giving them, even if it was a, a nice, sweet, positive message, that's great. They didn't even need to read my writing if they were just going to come away with some other message. I actually <laughs> have a message that I am trying to convey, and it matters. So when it comes to the Bible, of course it matters. It's like saying the Constitution of the United States doesn't really matter uh, what it says. I come up with this meaning and they come up with that. No, we actually have courts to decide, no, this is actually what it means. Uh, and when it comes to the Bible, this is God or Christians uh, speaking for God saying, you need to believe this or you will perish uh, eternally in some form or other. You better damn well believe it matters what is said. Uh, if if, if the Bible says God is love and the message of the Bible is God is love and he wants to save you and you read the Bible and walk away from it and says, well, I, it seems like God is hate and he wants everyone to be lost. Well, one of those might be the message, but not both of them. It absolutely matters. Uh, and so, uh, sorry, Brian, I, I know I see the nice, slow, soft swing <laughs> of the Iron Fist coming my way. <laughs> um, so we will continue this conversation on the board, I'm sure. But um, that is, um, that's one of those things that's a little bit frustrating to me because, I mean, what's the point of talking about the Bible and what it says if it can mean anything?
Yeah, absolutely. And especially, you know, even even if you don't think that God dictated the Bible or if you just inspired it or breathed it or whatever other action verb you can use to describe God's intentions with the Bible. If if Brian's saying that it doesn't matter what God intended the Bible, then the conversation's over. We can pack this whole thing up, right? If it doesn't matter what God's intentions are, then why should I spend a second worrying about God's intentions? Yep. Okay. I'm, I'm, I'm feeling ranty. I'm just going to read and uh, let, let's let's do this. John, uh, J-O-N, John, here are a couple of late thoughts uh, about the show, which I enjoyed quite a lot. One, the Bible contains a great example of teleportation in Acts chapter 8. Uh, and when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord carried Philip away. And the eunuch saw him no more and went on his way rejoicing. But Philip found himself at uh, Azotus, don't care. Uh, and as he passed through, he preached the gospel to all the towns until he came to Caesarea. Now, this leads me to my second thought, John says. Two, uh, non-Christians uh, take issue with many things in the Bible in the same way uh, that a sci-fi uh, fan base will tear a new installment that doesn't respect canon or introduce uh, capabilities that are later ignored or magic away various uh, conundrums. For example, the Acts author introduces the teleportation in a situation where it is unnecessary. The eunuch already believed, uh, needing no sign, there was no impending death or murderous horde. Uh, from which Philip needed rescuing, but it leaves the reader wondering why this device wasn't employed when, say, Stephen was being martyred. My conclusion after mulling uh, over so much of the Bible is that it is just really bad science fiction <laughs> or fantasy uh, if, you, if you quibble, and yet it has fans who argue that it is good writing, consistent, not only uh, with itself, but re with reality. But if Trek, Wars, Who, etc., uh, require the same reliance on things like uh, Molinism, Mol <laughs> Molinism uh, for things to make sense, the franchise would shrivel and die. Three. I, you know what? I don't think that I'm, for the sake of time, I'm going to cut off three and four um, and just say, uh, look, my friend, John, um, you you are engaging in the type of uh, mental exercise that helped get me out the door. <laughs> um, because I used to believe that everything made sense and was internally consistent. But when you just start looking at it, um, you find all kinds of inconsistencies, uh, all kinds of plot holes. Uh, and yeah. It, it doesn't seem to make sense uh, that you can do a teleportation in one place that's not necessary, but in another place, no, it's really important that that person die. And, uh, you know, a teleportation would be unheard of. Um, yeah, this is, um, it's, it's nuts. And uh, you, you kind of feel crazy when you realize that you have spent your life um, taking this book seriously. <laughs> when, when when you finally start uh, reading some of the things that uh, just don't make sense on uh, on any level, and so uh, I appreciate you, uh, John, and I would uh, I would recommend that you know Christians, if they can do it, just one time read the Gospels, say the Gospels and Acts, in a non devotional way. Just read it like science fiction. Read it like read it like fantasy. Uh, you know, just as if it were a good read. And I think you'll understand what John is saying. So uh, I, I'll leave it at that. Yeah, if I recall, I think I think John is some kind of a historian. I think I recall him from another thread where he got really knee deep in, in, in the uh, historical, histor historical uh, analysis of the Bible. Uh, and if that's so, I'd certainly love to hear more from him in other threads where we're ended up uh, talking about history. Uh, but one critique I got out of this uh, comment was a kind of a head nod to the idea that, you know, atheists read the Bible like fundamentalists. 
and, and I always, you know, kind of get my nostrils flared when someone makes that critique because, you know, again, show me the, the super decoder ring to show me the right way to read the Bible and I'll read it that way. But there's an infinite number of ways and combinations and hermeneutics to use on the Bible. I'm just grabbing one and going with that, right? So if, if that particular interpretation is wrong, fine. We'll go with another one, but how do you know it's wrong, right? You got to go back to the source and we don't have access to the source. So I just, I, I always find that as, as a way of, of throwing in a cheap shot that, that isn't applicable to that particular conversation. Right. Uh, one of the things that I used to say when uh, Dale and I uh, debated this, as we have a lot, uh, is that uh, I actually believe the fundamentalists are reading the Bible correctly in a literary way anyway, anyway more correctly than say the progressives because the thing is you want to read a document literally until uh it gives you reason uh to know for sure that it's not literal uh so you read it literally until you can't um right. you know so it it doesn't matter if you're reading let's say a fairy tale and it says you know once upon a time uh, there were there were three pigs you know, and they, and they built houses out of certain things. You might think, oh, well, this must be allegory because pigs don't build houses. But in the world of the fairy tale, it's literal. In the world of the fairy tale, if you were to, to put this on TV, you know, make an animated show, you would make a show with three pigs building houses because that's what the story is. You take it literally until you can't. You know, if Jesus says, I am the door, well, Okay, now I, I can't take that literally because he's a man and a man's not a door. So obviously, I'm not taking that literally. And, and I'm just giving a hermeneutical principle. I did a six part show on hermeneutics in the first season. Go look it up, people. Um, the, one, of the, one of the first and most basic re ways to read a document uh, and to understand the author, if, you, if there's no way of knowing what type of genre the author is writing, is to take it literally until you can't or until you have a really good reason. Uh, to take it as something else. Uh, and when you read the Bible that way, uh, you mostly get what you get with a fundamentalist church. Uh, and so I, I actually think that that is truer to the text. Um, that said, uh, I think it's yours. Yep. And I'm going to jump to the uh, next comment uh, is from the aforementioned Peter. We'll keep it in theme, him and Brian track on similar tracks uh, in some of these conversations. Uh, and Peter was uh, talking with Tyler and Peter writes, I don't know how many times I have to make the same point. Whether it's loving defines whether it's an offense. Exclamation point. Jesus repeatedly disobeyed Old Testament laws, which was taken literally aren't, which when taken literally aren't loving. Love defined his morality and his actions show your reading of what of that teaching is wrong. When did he ever quote an Old Testament law that when read literally isn't loving? Question. As to your wider point about selective reading, no one takes the whole Bible literally. The important thing is to have a consistent way to interpret it all, a consistent hermeneutic. What better lens to read it all than Jesus teaching and the hermeneutic of love, which he and Paul deployed. Now, I chose this post from Peter. Thank you, Peter. Always good chatting with you as well. He and I had had a bunch recently. Um, infuriating. Infuriating. Oh, I, mean, I, mean, <laughs> I love you, Peter. I really do love you. But oh, do you make my blood boil sometimes? Go, go ahead. I, I'm yeah. sorry. I'm, no, I'm you'll, okay. you'll, you'll, right. you'll get your crack at Peter, but I, I got the bat now. Let me hold the bat. <laughs> I'm of course joking, Peter. I'm joking, but anyway, here comes the bat. Oh, no, it's a Brian. It's it. a Brian bat covered in, in, in you know uh, foam. It's a nice, you know, it's a big foam bat. Uh, but anyway, um, so so yeah, the thing that Peter does in these conversations consistently is he'll open with, "There are many, many ways to interpret things. We should all come to the table with our interpretations," and, and then he'll flip the coin on the other side and say, "My way is the right way." The way I'm interpreting is the right way, and you're doing it wrong. And then when you ask him why it's wrong, he says, oh, no, it's just my way. That's, that's what I do. It's how I'm reading it, right? So I, I, this double standard of you know my way or the highway and all views are equal, I, I, it's like pinning jello to the wall, uh, which is the, the, the feeling that I get when I'm, when I'm talking uh, with Peter on these topics. 
Um, so the idea that Jesus is the hermeneutic, it's all based on love, and that's the way to read the Bible, full stop. Great. There's your claim. I've got my Hitchens razor in my hand. Where's your evidence? Back that up as more than just your personal subjective opinion of how it should be done. Is that the way it was intended by the authors? Is that the way it was intended by God? How do you know that? And show me that you know that. I like this dramatic no one reading. Takes, no one takes the whole Bible literally. <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> yes, they do. <laughs> I know. It... <laughs> Where are you in the world? You mean to tell me that in your part of the world, you don't know anybody who takes the whole Bible literally? <laughs> Honestly, I don't buy it. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, of course they do. You, you've listened to Unbelievable probably for as long as I have. You've heard them. You, you read their books. You know who they are. Of course they do. You see them on TV. Of course they do. What do you yep. mean? Um, and, 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 this and, is... there are, and there are people that take the opposite things literally, right? There are people that take only some things literally, and they're the opposite things that some other group take literally. There's literally yep. every combination. I, everything in the Bible is taken literally uh, over a broad enough group of people. Um, you're not going to find anything in the Bible where everybody says, oh, no, that's figurative. <laughs> right. So um, this is this is kind of what I mean by gaslighting. Um, yep. Of course, uh, people and lots of them, huge swaths of them take it literally. Uh, if, if it if that wasn't so, I wouldn't be here doing this. <laughs> I wouldn't be the I wouldn't be the me that I am today. Don't tell me that I am just some uh, aberrant creation of my own making. I am not. <laughs> so, um, so much here, but we we are just running out of time. I actually wanted to keep this short, and I know that you've got a hard stud. That is not the time. Um, yeah, we could. We I think we I think we made, we. We made the important point here. So, and I got I got a good amount of time left, so we can keep going. Okay. All right. Um, you already made the point about um, love uh, being um, the, the the key to understanding uh, the Bible. Uh, yes, the Bible says that God is love. You have to get pretty far down in it <laughs> before yeah. you get there. So there are other things it says that God is too. Um, this idea of everything being interpreted through Jesus simply doesn't make sense uh, because two thirds of the book have no Jesus in it. Before yep. you get to Jesus, you've got two thirds of the book. And that means that the people for the thousands of years that that supposedly represents have never heard of Jesus. And the God that they are supposedly worship, they get they got that wrong. And so if Jesus was the whole point, he should have been in Genesis. And we could have stuck Moses somewhere in Matthew. Uh, and then we could have understood the Bible correctly. And, and all those generations of people who, who didn't get Jesus could have understood it correctly. Uh, but instead, you stick uh, Jesus in the last third, and then you arbitrarily say, yeah, it's about this guy. I don't think so. That that argument does not work for me. Moving, uh, moving. Uh, Anthony 66. Uh, again, we see another Bayesian uh, blow against Christianity here. What is more likely, uh, the more likely explanation? And only God uh, was the genesis of most, the most important message ever known to humanity, but entrusted it to the spread uh, of it to humans who he knew would distort the message failed to deliver the message uh, due to weakness, failed to deliver the message because of isolation, encounter language and cultural barriers, act like dorks uh, in delivering the message and argue what the uh, message actually is, or rather the message arose in a more natural milieu of uh, socio-political, religio-culture, and there 
was no other way to get it out, but through the means of those very humans who created it. And for the sake of time, I will stop that message there because that's the part I care about anyway. Um, so yeah, uh, really, if this is, if the Bible and then prophets and then street preachers uh, <laughs> were the best that God could do to, to get this message out, screw that guy. <laughs> because ultimately, he, he delivered the message in ways that are most ignorable, in, in ways that are the least believable. I mean, if you think about it, if you, if you, um, let's, let's just make it a secular message. Someone comes and says, all you have to do is uh, give me all of your money, empty out your savings account, uh, and then go to a desert in Arabia and wait there for 40 days, and you will have every treasure you ever wanted. And uh, how, how does that message sent? you know, by some dude who got a vision? <laughs> really? Are you going to listen to that guy? <laughs> he's, he's got some scrolls. Does that make it better? <laughs> he's a, he's a, tell me what, you can't come up with a least, real, a less reliable way to send a message like that than the ways that God chose. Uh, and so I just, I, I appreciate um, Anthony's um, uh, way of putting it here and I just wanted to to hang a lantern on that and uh, echo the sentiment. Yeah, absolutely. For for the for the most powerful being in the universe, he, he didn't even send the B or C team. He sent the Z team. Uh, if this is what this is what we got. <laughs> I mean Abraham. He said Abraham. Right. Yeah, I'll kill my kid. All right. <laughs> you're you're you're, <laughs> that you're guy? wearing. A you're wearing a burlap sack. Why should I listen to what you have to say? <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I think that uh, you've got something from uh, current events, uh, which is better than me because I got nothing from current events. No problem. Yeah, no, this is so this one is from Tyler. Uh, and it's uh, this is for the Christian show on current events. And he writes, well, many apologists and Trump himself have suggested Christians could face restrictions on practicing their religion in the future. What utter nonsense, but fear tactics can work, especially as many Christians love to feel persecuted. It is true that Christians may no longer be able to impose their ideas about marriage on broader society, but that is not a persecution of Christians who are still free to marry only the opposite gender. Although gay Christians seem to be a growing thing. Well done, Randall Rouser, who recently called out Franklin Graham for such awfulness. Uh, for example, use of BS fear tactics. He also lays into Eric Metaxas in the comments section to his blog. And of course, he has been one of the biggest Christian critics of Ravi Zacharias. Randall gets my vote for Christian of the Year. Randall also complains in the comments section that many Christians try to uh, hush him up on these matters. And that sounds like deplatforming de attempts to me. Lastly, Teddy complained on the podcast about atheists using disingenuous arguments. Not sure what she meant by that, but there are plenty. There have been plenty of dis, uh, disingenuous arguments from Christians as per above. Uh, yeah, I just I picked this comment just because I thought it was. It's amazing to me how um, ingrained um, Christian Christians, in particular evangelical Christians, have been wrapped up with the GOP. That they can accept someone so unchristlike as Trump, just to get a couple of policy initiatives that they've, you know, wedded themselves to to get them through, to get a couple of judges, maybe, you know, get abortion overturned or something. Uh, it, like, forget like not throwing out the baby with the bathwater. You've literally thrown out everything, except for a couple of drops at the bottom of the tub. It, mm -hmm. it just, it, it, and it's good to see that there are Christians that don't take that view. Someone like Randall, who I agree, I've read what he's had to say on current events, and he absolutely puts feet to the fire where they should be put. Uh, and I just wish that, that uh, you know, more Christians could be more open to acknowledging the, the major, major downfalls associated with trying to hold on to these uh, little wins that they do politically. Yeah, uh, Randall's a friend, so shout out to Randall for um, being one of those uh, contributors uh, to the show. He's opened every season of um, Skeptics and Seekers that we've done uh, so far. It's become a tradition now. So um, I 
uh, just a quick shout out there. Um, you know, the, uh, Trump as Christian um, idea, I just want to point out the Christians who viewed Trump that way are exactly the kinds of Christians uh, that uh, Peter is saying don't exist. <laughs> <laughs> right. That's what they got. Yep. There are like 74 million of them <laughs> who voted for him this time is more than the last time. <laughs> so, <laughs> yes, they're out there. They're half of the voting population. <laughs> so, but nope, they don't exist. I don't know what you're talking about. No, I mean, come on. <laughs> so, yeah, that's um, it, it is interesting to see what um, Christians of good conscience. Uh, will exchange not just about Trump. Uh, this is true in uh, lots of elections. Uh, what Christians of good conscience are willing to exchange um, for having someone that they think is a godly person. That seems to be the least of the requirements for them. They can sacrifice that in anything that that person does if they get blank. And for them, it's often tax cuts. You know, I get to keep my money. Um, or a, a vote against abortion, uh, great, because that issue is important to me. Uh, or, you know, it's whatever, whatever the issue is, it's one or two or three issues where they say, okay, that's more important than the person leading the country being a decent human being. Um, and, and more to the point, they're willing to not just support the person and hold their nose, but to wrap a cloak of purple around them as if he were appointed by God. Yes. Uh, that's a trade I never could have made as a Christian. I, in fact, I did not. Um, and uh, there's, there's no way I could have done that um, today. So uh, interesting. I'm glad that we had those shows. We had a, a conservative show on current events and a Christian show uh, on current events. And uh, you can go back and listen to those if you are a masochist. Um, <laughs> so uh, we get a comment from Brian the Mod. Good listen. Uh, <laughs> uh, by the way, <laughs> just so you know, uh, because I have, I have read many of Brian's posts, which uh, after a show are always complimentary. I just get nervous like a kicked dog. Whenever I see a post start, good job, guys. Good. That was a good show. Now, uh, here, comes the, here comes the knife. Here comes the knife. Yeah, so, am, so already I'm cringing. <laughs> good listen. Uh, okay. That's how I hear it. <laughs> Um, David and I uh, did an after show a while back uh, on the resurrection. I wanted to reintroduce a point I made there, discussing whether uh, there is historical evidence uh, for the resurrection. It's largely non sequitur because if God exists today and wants uh, things of us now, then it doesn't matter what happened 2,000 years ago. Uh, he could have clearly uh, and demonstrably made his agenda known to us here and now. Uh, see, uh, so either God doesn't exist, cannot successfully communicate his message uh, contemporaneously, or doesn't care to. None of these things are in my control. So why would I concern myself with them? Meanwhile, time machine on and the claim that Jesus will be back soon becomes more implausible with each passing Second, thank you for that uh, comment. And I just, uh, I wanted to highlight it because it was something that gave me a little dance uh, to see. And I wish um, it's a point that was made by more people more often. I don't care um, what gods did in the days of Zeus. Okay, let's just, let's, those stories, they came from somewhere, right? Surely something must have happened. Uh, I don't care. <laughs> I really don't. I don't care um, about the Hindu monkey god that came on the scene 5,000 years ago. I don't care. <laughs> um, I, I am right here right now. And if a god 
cared enough about a people that he would go come to earth at a particular place in a particular time uh, and talk to a particular people group, if he cared enough about those people, then he should do that for all of the people, not just those people. Um, and so if you're a Jew, uh, good for you. Uh, maybe you should look into your history. Don't know. Uh, if you live in the Middle East, good for you, you know, because God seemed to like that part of the world better. I am not a Jew. I am not a Middle Easterner. And I'm not a first century. Don't care. If he wants to talk to me, uh, the, uh, the statute of limitations on his <laughs> work on earth is uh, so he needs to he needs to talk to another generation who has not seen or heard from him in a very long time and only knows of him as stories. And I'm perfectly fine only knowing of him as stories if he is content to leave it that way. Yep, absolutely. Thank you for bringing that good stuff into relief. And and one one piece of feedback that that can come to this that I wanted to head off at the pass is this idea that you know so is. It, asking if what I'm saying is if history doesn't matter. And of course, the answer to that is no, right? We have to study history of humans because we have no other way of analyzing those facts because we don't have an omnipotent deity involved. Genghis Khan can't show up today to talk about what was going on back in his day. Neither JFK, neither MLK, or any other K that you want to bring to the table here. We have to study- There's one guys. too many Ks, my friend. There is, see, if I went one more, I would have, the buzzer would have went off or something. <laughs> Um, but we cannot study what happened in those times with those people without doing history. But if there's supposedly an omnipotent deity, then history doesn't matter. He can do it right here, right now, as forcefully as necessary. So it's just, it's, to me, it's just you know, clear what the shell game going on there is. Right. And also, when it comes to history, these historical figures, Genghis Khan did not have a message to the whole world for all time. Uh, so Genghis Khan actually had nothing to say to me. Right. Uh, you know, it's, it, it is perhaps valuable to know what he had to say to the people he said it to, but he didn't, he didn't actually have anything to say to me. My, my immortal soul is not in any danger from not knowing, uh, Genghis Khan's message or whether I even believe he existed or not. I, I do, but even if I didn't, wouldn't matter. <laughs> right. Um, you know, I would be ignorant of an important time in history, uh, but that's the extent of it. But this God who did these events in this place at that time, uh, those actions were somehow supposed to be significant to all people everywhere for all time. Uh, that's, where I, that's where I have a problem with it. Um, if what he wants to do is communicate, communicate a message to all people, then he should have spoken to all people at once. That was within his power. Uh, and if he wanted the, the message to be everywhere, not just regional, he could have he could have put his people everywhere, uh, not just regional. And if he wanted it for all time, he could reiterate that message and make sure that every generation uh, has representatives of him who are actually representatives of him, uh, and that and that is clear to us. But he didn't do that. It's a very local, regional, um, uh, ethnic religion, uh, frankly, and it has nothing to do to me uh, with me. It has no more to do with me than many of the African uh, religions uh, that many people took very seriously and were very important to them. Um, and if it's supposed to have more meaning than that to me, then he's going to have to come and and do better because it's been two thousand years, man. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, for my next my next comment, I'm actually not going to read it because it's long, and I want to make sure we get down the the page here. But I just want to point out that this poster, this is also from the current events uh, uh, message board. It, it's a Klim. Is that how we've decided we're going to say it? A A K L Y M. A Klim. He um. Man, it's he's so wrong the last time. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We had exactly. But uh, he puts a really neat story of, of a time way back in the day when he bumped into Joe Biden in the halls of power. And it's just a mm -hmm. really interesting story, a really interesting post. And this uh, this poster always writes really, uh, really uh, good stuff when he when he chimes in. So i am just uh, wanted to point him out so that hopefully he'll come back and post more stuff because I want to read more good stories and hear more thoughts. from him. Dee Blair. Uh, hello. 
haven't joined the comments before, but I've enjoyed the show. Actually, uh, this, I think we, we we did this one already. <laughs> no, this is one. This is the, my first it, one I did. Oh, yeah, this was your first one. I'm oh, sorry. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah. I, it's okay. Uh, the medicine will wear off eventually. Um, uh, Anthony sixty six. Um, I think he has been quoted more than anybody, uh, and that's usually not the case in these comment shows. Uh, but he had a lot to say uh, over the last few weeks. Uh, this is a difficult topic. Uh, I don't think that we can uh, legislate against all forms of uh, potential psychological abuse by parents uh, as a result of wacky religious views. Uh, and I'm actually going to put a pin in it there uh, and just remind people of the show that was done uh, a couple of weeks uh, back with uh, Dave Pegg. Uh, there was some uh, quite a bit of debate, and I wish that we have more of that debate. On exactly what you what is good for teaching kids and what's not. That's the conversation I would really like to have. But before we can have that specific conversation, we have to have the conversation on what is um, psychological abuse and what isn't, and what we can do with psychological abuse. This is one of those things where every skeptic who um, had something to say took me to task. Uh, so for those people uh, like Dale out there who think that we're some kind of club, you, uh, we're the worst club ever. <laughs> <These> are, <laughs> so um, when there are no Christians to beat me up, there are plenty of skeptics to do it for them. Um, so uh, don't tase me, bro. Um, <laughs> so, I, if Dave, I understand, if Dave, I bring it. <laughs> If, uh, if, Dave, if David if David is Caesar, then he's got a team full of Brutes. <laughs> <It's Yeah. crass. laughs> but I, you know, I wouldn't want it any other way. Um, of course, this is this is one of those subjects that is deep enough and important enough that it's worth having some serious disputation over, uh, so that we can understand where we are and begin to build uh, bridges uh, towards solutions. Uh, the, my, the main thing from this particular conversation that I wanted to say on the show is that there was actually some agreement between me and Dave Pegg, although I think it was a bit grudging on his part, that there are things that you can say to kids uh, and ways to raise kids that would be abusive. What he said, though, on the show was, but it shouldn't be illegal. And right. where we get to is this place where I understand all of the people who came at me um, are saying, look, you can't legislate. Uh, you can't legislate some things. I get that, but we do try to legislate against abuse. And so if you identify abuse, it doesn't matter to me that we have no way of enforcing it. We don't have any way of enforcing it now. Uh, parents abuse their kids all the time and we can't, we don't enforce it well. Uh, there's there's sexual abuse and physical abuse and uh, all manner of emotional abuse, and and parents largely get away with it. They mostly get away with it. Uh, there's there's no real mechanism built in our society uh, to safeguard kids in that way. The mechanisms we have are not sufficient. That's not the point for me. The point is, if it's abuse, then we should be bold enough to say that's abuse and it shouldn't happen. Uh, and that's my only point. I haven't I haven't taken it to the next logical step. So I don't I don't know what you do once you get there. But you don't shy away from saying something is abuse simply because you don't know how to legislate. It. Absolutely. That's all. That's a that, that is a That's fantastic all. period put on that point. Absolutely. Okay. All right. Uh, my, take it away. My next one is resurrection, next man. Yep, and aliens. Don't leave out the aliens because that's the, <laughs> that's the juxtaposition that's important. Can I just say before you get in there, Susanna, yeah. uh, I yeah. miss you. Yeah. Uh, you you are one of the great posters, even though you uh, haven't been around long. I know you're still out there. Uh, please come back. <laughs> uh, I love reading your posts. Uh, go ahead. Concur. So she had to say on this topic. Uh, I'm a non-believer, so I suppose I'm biased, but to me, just asking David Jay and Matthew to put the virgin birth to the side and then asking about the historical Jesus felt a little nonsensical to me. How many other things claimed about Jesus can be put aside before we're not talking about the same guy? 
This reminds me of when apologists bring up that even atheists such as Bart Ehrman say that Jesus existed. Yeah, he thought that an ap apocalyptic charismatic preacher existed, a human being who died and was dead and is dead. As far as I can see, he isn't confirming the Jesus of Christianity. So how much is he agreeing, agreeing with you, really? Then I just w also wanted to comment on the alien, ab uh, alien abduction comparison and how it wasn't analogous since there was this expectation when it came to alien abductions, whereas the same couldn't be said about the resurrection stuff. And sure, perhaps there wasn't an uh, expectation of Christianity in particular, but weren't there like at least a couple of false messiahs around at the same time? Wasn't there some sort of expectation? Don't some Christians even say it was prophesied in the Old, Old Testament? How can it have been so unexpected then? Seems weird. It is not possible that there were many, is it not possible that there were many different groups with different ideas floating around and that the one that stuck is the one that we know most about today? That doesn't mean it was true. She, she hit a lot of these. I just wanted to say, I agree. She should post more because man, did she just hit like right on the, the top of the nail, a bunch of different points yeah. there. The equivocation I, I between. I yep. can't add to it. I can't add yeah. to it. It's um, this was one of my favorite posts of the season, uh, to, to be perfectly honest. And um, the uh, point uh, about uh, prophecy. Uh, yep. She said some Christians <laughs> believe that he was prophesied about. Uh, let's make that the vast majority <laughs> of Christians. Uh, there are people who uh, may be far left progressive uh, who don't uh, read prophecy that way. But the vast majority of Christians uh, claim as a matter of doctrine uh, that Jesus was prophesied about uh, in the Old Testament. And so you can't say that there was no expectation of this and that he was prophesied about for thousands of years before he showed up. <laughs> that, yep, 100%. That, uh, yeah. So thank you, uh, Susan. Am I? No, 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 no. I hope I didn't skip one. Um, uh, okay. I think we have another Brian Mod. Hello, Brian Mod. See, this, uh, is, this, is the benefit, this is the benefit of coming on the show. You get more airtime, right? So to all you out there <laughs> that want airtime, come on the show, and then your comments get highlighted. It's a, it's a, it's a, a circle, a vicious circle. Absolutely. Good show. <laughs> <laughs> See, now I'm going to get out of the habit of this now because you're, 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 you're making me self-conscious. I'm going to stop here, doing that. <laughs> here it comes again. Let me see. Thanks, uh, thanks to Three Davids. Um, and um, and a Sarah, a Sarah. How about the Sarah? I was riffing um, on three men and a baby. It was three men and a baby I, riff. I, that was the whole thing. I was hoping people would guess. That's fine. Uh, that's fine. Three Davids and a Sarah. Mm, Sarah is inimitable. It's funnier the more you say it. <laughs> <laughs> One more time. No. <laughs> Good show. Uh, we'll get into the uh, particular soon. But I uh, wanted to start with uh, two upper level thoughts, uh, taking offense. Uh, so uh, this was uh, the one with uh, Dave Pegg, uh, obviously. Um, David, uh, Dave Pegg uh, had thought that I was speaking about him specifically in our blog post, post any took offense, and basically Brian uh, said, uh, no, that's just David, he's an ass. <laughs> once, you, once you realize that, <laughs> it's it's all right. Uh, he can't it, help it's himself. Yeah, it's that's exactly what I said. Everybody, you can read his post. Uh, legal versus not legal. I wanted to get to this part. Was uh, the least interesting path uh, to take in this discussion, uh, and it dominated a large portion of the time. I would have uh, much rather heard discussion of ethical, moral, uh, pro-social. Uh, reasonable angles that the legality, I think David J uh, makes a strong case for his position in this space, but they come across very inflammatory. If you aren't steeled to discuss it in this way, I think this uh, blogged the, no, sorry, bogged things down, especially given the debate uh, partners are in two different countries in legal systems. And I want to say, yeah, I, I think I agree with that. Um, as much as I would 
uh, like to not agree with it. Uh, I think that there maybe could have been some more preliminary work before having that particular discussion. But I, I got a feeling that no matter how much preliminary work you do, it's always going to be a different discussion when you're talking about how people raise their kids. And the first time you have that conversation, uh, it's just, it's never going to go down well. Yeah, I, I think you're right. And I think, I think that's why it, this was good to be a springboard. Hopefully there's more conversation in the future. Uh, I was just, I was thinking about a parallel where, you know, as far as I know, it's not illegal to tell your kids they're worthless every day of their life. So does because it's not illegal mean we should do it? There's a whole continuum here of good to bad, right to wrong, reasonable to unreasonable, dangerous to uplifting. You know, it, it, it just, when you get to legal versus not legal, it just becomes binary and, and it, it very much less interesting to me. That was kind of my- Right, my and I, I think when I talk about legality in this case, I'm speaking almost hyper, hi, hi, hyperbolically, not exactly, not entirely, but almost in, in the same way that uh, we say, just kind of as a, a figure of speech, that ought to be illegal, right. um, you know, about any number of outrages. Man, did you see that? That ought to be illegal. Um, it's, it's not that we're making a statement that Congress should meet and vote on whether this thing should be legal or not, uh, but we're saying that's outrageous and it shouldn't happen. Um, that's, that's what that means. And so I, I think analyzing my own self, when I, when I talk about legality in this sense, that's kind of what I'm talking about. So the example that you gave, um, of telling a kid they're worthless every day of their life, that ought to be illegal. Well, I mean that in a hyperbolic way. I also right. mean it. Literally, uh, mm -hmm. that really ought to be illegal. Uh, I understand it's not illegal. I, I get that. Uh, and I understand that we're never going to be able to make it legal. But that doesn't change the fact that it ought to be illegal. You ought not be able to do that to a kid. Right. And I 100% I agree with that. The problem is, is once you bring in the is it currently legal and is it, should it be legal? It, it just brings out the constitutional scholars and the small government people. And it, 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 the, my point is the conversation goes in a completely different, largely yes. academic, pragmatic, you know, I don't want the government telling me what I should say or think. And, and on some plane, I 100% agree with those people. Can we now get back to whether or not parents should be telling their children that they're worthless or not? I mean, you talk about missing the forest for the trees, right? Like that, that was kind of how uh, the, the the conversation hit me after a while in that way. So I, I wanted to I wanted to actually highlight that com comment because once again, um, this is a shitty club. This is a shitty <laughs> club. This is my ego club. Are you are you kidding me? <laughs> so the, anyway. the hive mind is spoken. <laughs> we only agree oh. on everything. Nobody, nobody respects me around here. I mean, I'm the Rodney, Rodney, Rodney Dangerfield of this place. <laughs> so, um, what, what possibly could Darren have said uh, that um, made made you choose one of his comments? Let's see. So, Darren, Darren Lute, uh, from the also from the Resurrection and Alien show, says the experts are not only assuming that i believe that's a quote he's quoting someone the experts are not only assuming that and he writes sure they are i invite you to do an exercise it will take a while so i don't expect you to do it if you don't feel like it but i hope you do the exercise because it will completely change how you see the reliability of the experts and now i'm awaiting some sort of uh energy drink or something to be pitched to me but anyway continuing i want you to compare three hypotheses the first is that Paul was completely, and Paul uh, from the Bible, was completely honest and everything he said was true. The second hypothesis is that Paul was correct about some of the things he said, but incorrect about others. Motivation doesn't really matter. Maybe he was delusional or maybe he was malicious. The third hypothesis is that none of Paul write, Paul's writings are accurate. He was a con man and a cult leader making things up to gather a following. Now, go through all the historical evidence we have access to and see if you can rule out any of these hypotheses. This will require to follow uh, following a lot of the, the sources the experts are using. 
back to their beginning. Sometimes you will need to go back five to 10 layers to find, so be diligent. You will also need to take into consideration the time of the writings and the location of the document was written. As a secondary exercise, answer the question, can you find anything at all that rules out uh, hypothesis three? What can we know about Christian history before Paul if hypothesis three is the hypothesis that ends up being true? This exercise will show you why I say the experts, experts are assuming that Paul was telling the truth. I just thought this was a really, really bright spotlight on the limitations uh, in the historical method uh, when, with regards to um, ascertaining the truth of Christianity proper. I agree. Uh, I thought this was one of uh, Darren's best ever, uh, actually. Uh, yeah. And it, it does highlight one thing that is, in, in fact, a part of the historical method, which is when you see an ancient doctrine, you should always assume uh, that the things are true and that it's legitimate until you have some reason uh, to not. Uh, now, I, dis I disagree with this. Uh, I don't think you should uh, just assume that th the writer of this document was was uh, being faithful to, to anything. Uh, but uh, historians uh, tend to start uh, with uh, believing the uh, the trustworthiness of the documenter, and I don't believe um, documenters of uh, religious leaders, uh, re documenters of religion. <laughs> that is, I don't I don't believe in it's not just Paul with Christianity. Um, I believe Paul's uh, testimony. About as much as I, uh, as about as much as Christians believe Muhammad's testimony. And I'm very sorry, everyone, that I'm having trouble uh, getting words out today. Um, it'll be better next week, I promise. Um, but so I'll I'll just leave it there. Christians are very good at disbelieving every document when it comes to ancient religions that aren't Christianity, but they're extremely. Um, is it credulous or incredulous? They're, they're extremely credulous. They, they believe. believe. Yeah, okay. They're, they're extremely yeah. credulous uh, when it comes to uh, religious documents that point to Christianity. And uh, there's no reason that anyone has to believe that Paul uh, was being any more honest about uh, his great deeds and his experience and encounter with Jesus than we have to believe uh, Benny Hinn. Right. And, and, and it's completely fine to use to use the tools of history, like take the starting point that Paul was was telling the truth. And, and again, not not the capital T truth, but Paul's not misleading. He's trying to communicate something and you can do all the tools and the, and the analyses and get to an end point. But you've got to go back to the beginning after that fact. You can't just assume, well, yeah, so it says Christianity is true. But if the original assumption that Paul was was telling truthful history is not correct then the whole thing falls apart. So you can't just put your stamp at the end and forget that you made a pretty big assumption at the beginning when you did the analysis. All right, so we're almost done here. Let's um, let's push through these last uh, few. Yeah. Tyler uh, says on miracles, one of the uh, Christians expressed much skeptic skepticism about modern day uh, reported miracles. This was from our show last week, uh, by yeah. the way. Um, Going as far uh, as uh, indicating there are many fraudulent Christians today. Plus, he mentioned uh, psychosomatic medical conditions. Surely, these concerns also apply to miracles reported in the Bible. I expect it was generally easier to bamboozle people in ancient times. Plus, there is plenty of scope for misreporting when accounts of these miracles were written down decades later by unknown persons who may have had uh, an agenda to, uh, to, uh, to convert. The number of reported miracles uh, at uh, Lourdes has been declining as we uh, become smarter. Can one disagree with, oh, uh, the other one, the other comment he had was on whether one can disagree with God. And I'm yeah. just gonna, for the sake of time, 
Uh, miracles, uh, yes, um, Tyler, yes, uh, uh, amen. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I found this to be uh, a particularly good point in another uh, example of a kind of a double standard where Christians, um, you know, who are kind of put to the question uh, often express skepticism about modern day miracles. But they have no skepticism at all when it comes to um, miracles in the Bible. And uh, so I, I, I don't know what, what mental processes or academic rigor they're putting to the miracles that make them confident in those, but that make them skeptical about the ones they can see here uh, today. Yeah, absolutely. And elsewhere in that thread, he posted a great graphic of, uh, it shows a graph of miracles before photography being very high. And then after photography is invented, they go real down. And then once Photoshop is invented, they go back up. So it's kind of, it just shows, it shows what the, you know, that the details and context in which these things happen matter and where, uh, you know, gullibility and, and skepticism should be best applied. All right. Uh, I think... That is my last one, actually. Yes. I, I I had I was gonna separate these as two comments, but um I think I think we can omit the last one. Uh so I will let you finish us out with the rest of your comments. Okay. I will start with uh the a comment from Drew Lyle on the Skeptics uh on current events show. And this comment got about a hundred upvotes and was called the post of the year by a lot of people. And that's why I wanted to pull it in here because it is excellent. Yeah, I, me, I was one of them. Then again, yep. I've given out the post of, of, of the year trophy to a lot of people. Yep. Uh, and there are a lot of people with, uh, you know, trophies, trophies coming. It's in the mail. <laughs> um, You're a generous grader. Yeah, <laughs> I'm not responsible for actually mailing out the trophies. People. <laughs> you're, um, you're, you're the you're the Oprah of uh, of message boards, and you get a comment, and you get a trophy, and you get a trophy. <laughs> but anyway. yeah, if you could read this one in, in its entirety, uh, I, I know that most of this is quoted, but this really is a fantastic comment. Yeah. So Drew writes, "This is from a comment thread at the Washington Post, which explains Trumpists and Christians pretty well." To understand the connection Trump has with his supporters, it's helpful to know a term from the world of pro wrestling, kayfabe. Kayfabe has been around for generations, and it refers to the unspoken contract between wrestlers and spectators. We'll present you something clearly fake under the insistence that it's real, and you will experience genuine emotion. Neither party acknowledges the bargain, or else the magic is ruined. To a wrestling audience, the fake and the real coexist peacefully. If you ask a fan whether a match or a backstage brawl was scripted, the question will seem irrelevant. You may as well ask a roller coaster rider whether he knows he's not really on a runaway mine car. Kefebe isn't about factual veritability, it's about emotional fidelity. Ask the average Trump supporter whether he or she thinks the president actually planned to build a giant wall and have Mexico pay for it, and you might get an answer that boils down to, I don't think so, but I believe so. That's Kefebe. Chance of build the wall or lock her up aren't about building a structure or making arrests. They're about how cathartic it feels in the moment to yell with venom against a common enemy. Kefebe isn't merely a suspension of disbelief. It is a philosophy about truth itself. It rests on the assumption that feelings are inherently more trustworthy than facts. Donald Trump, who is in the Worldwide uh, Wrestling Federation Hall of Fame, engages in Kefebe and he wrote it all the way to the White House and uses it to this day. I have absolutely nothing to add to that because that is that is capital T truth uh, in yeah. a laser beam. I, I felt the exact same way. Uh, so thanks for sharing uh, sharing that. Um, it it it's a powerful observation. Um, Thanksgiving. Yes. So this is um, this is a post uh, from uh, some poster. Uh, I, I always pronounce this wrong. Deandvija thirteen. Nailed it. Uh, he's that been guy? banned recently. Yeah. Oh, but, that, that 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 guy needs a leash. Yeah, that one. Yeah. 
Anyway, he, um, this was a great show. I really enjoyed this. I wish more conversation happened on this one. Uh, but you write, uh, I believe speaking with Dale, uh, you and I fundamentally disagree. There are plenty of good things that are true from our past that we can and should celebrate. Part of the reason we celebrate is to remember. And if we are lying about events and whitewashing them, then we are not remembering. We are passing down lies to our children so that they do not know the truth of what they are celebrating. When you say that nothing should ruin your holiday fun, you are saying that the truth of atrocities don't matter. You somehow bifurcate them in your mind so that you can visit the reality one moment, then indulge in the fun of the lie the next moment. I have no problem setting aside a day where we focus on what we are thankful for, but to conflate that with atrocities so that we can pretend they, uh, they didn't happen and were actually good things is the very heart of the deception that you say you are against. You believe lying is one of the worst sins, but as long as the lie is accompanied by good food and good feelings, then it is okay. That does not compute. And this instance on upholding this false celebration by Christians convinces me all the more of the religious motivation behind it. Finally, when are people supposed to learn the truth? Parents teach kids false things about it. Schools teach kids false things about it. Kids grow up as adults who know false things about Turkey Day. It would be like turning the Holocaust into a celebration of how Christians showed kindness to the Jews. There could be presents and cake and dancing. And the only thing we tell that lie is at the expense of the truth and the Holocaust. It seems like you would have no problem with that because it doesn't matter what happened to all those Jews all those years ago. None of that will stop your Holocaust celebration. Good time. We will never see eye to eye on that. And that, I think, is one of your best posts of the year. That was... Wow, that was like a nuclear bomb of get your shit together. I'd love to hear a little well, I, more of your thought process on that. I I appreciate it. I obviously was not high on tramadol at the time. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so uh, I did enjoy that show. And this is one of the uh, shows that Dale um, did. Uh, I think Dale was on that show. Uh, uh, it was you and David Russell. Actually, yeah, it was Dale. You you, you pulled in. Yeah, I think week, I think Dale was on that show. Um, yeah. And I I always appreciate having Dale on the show. Whatever you think of Dale, uh, audience, if the only thing you know about Dale is that sometimes he blows his lid, uh, goes mad dog, and deletes his post, that that's not enough knowledge about Dale. Okay, because we're all a little nuts on discussion boards, and you should <laughs> you should have a little bit of charity when it comes to stuff like that. Uh, Dale is uh, an engaging conversationalist, um, and he's a little bit like Marvin. He's not someone that maybe you're going to have a long written communication with, but if you ever have the chance to talk to him for a while, uh, and when Dale and I did the show, no matter how heated the show got, we always uh, spent time after the show was over uh, and we would talk for two, three hours sometimes. Uh, we, we never left the show angry, uh, and we always sought to uh, understand the other person's position, uh, and we had a beautiful time uh, when we were doing the show. So I just wanted to give you some of that background. Um, and so I, I have good reason to appreciate Dale, and so does everyone uh, on the board. And so that was one of those shows where he uh, joined in, and I... I uh, want to call him out as, uh, you know, someone who who volunteers to do that from time to time. Yeah, and I, and I, I would concur with all of that. Uh, and just to echo your point on the topic at hand, uh, this Christmas for our family was one of the first where uh, none of the kids believed in Santa Claus anymore. And we still put the carrots by the fireplace. We still set out a glass of milk on the counter. We still read a night before Christmas before going to bed. Uh, and, you know, I still hid the presents somewhere in the house so they wouldn't be seen until they were under the tree. So you can ha have the magic. You can have the holiday without saying with a, a straight face. Yeah, Santa Claus is a real guy. And that's that's it's I think like the Disneyland. Yeah, 100 percent. Yeah. I mean, you don't have to you don't have to believe in Mickey Mouse to enjoy Mickey Mouse. <laughs> Right. You know? So, so um, no, no one is no one is saying ha don't have Thanksgiving dinner and enjoy your family and be grateful and thankful, but don't lie about what the history of, of the actual event was. Say why you've changed it to be more uh, in line with with good thing. Right, and um, uh, something that has slipped my mind, so it wasn't important. <laughs> 
Um, <laughs> it seemed profound at the time. <laughs> but, I'm, but, uh, I'm yeah, sure it'll come. I, I'm sure it'll come to you later. <laughs> yeah, I'm. I'm. Um, I'm okay with. Oh yeah, I know what I was going to say. This whole putting milk out for Santa Claus. Yeah. It, doesn't anyone have cats? <laughs> that would never work at my house. I have a cat. She's uh, she's 21 years old. Um, if I put a glass of milk out, Santa Claus is not going to get that milk. <laughs> she's going to first <laughs> knock it over, uh, and then she's going to spend the night licking it up. I don't I don't understand this milk tradition <laughs> in a in a place that's so cat heavy. So uh, uh, someone's going to have to explain that to me. The, the cat the cat is helping to perpetuate the myth. So. You know, kudos to the cat. <laughs> I think a lot of people are caging their cats on Christmas night. This was happening. I, you're probably right. <laughs> All um, right, you you've got a couple gonna, more. Yeah, I'm gonna. I think I'm gonna skip a couple. Uh, I'm just gonna point a couple out. The Titus comment is too long from the politics thread, but I I just wanted to redline. He puts a lot of good biblical effort in defending uh, anti-violence. And I'm pretty sure he was talking, what was it with Teddy on the show about uh, violence in Christianity and, and what's commanded and what's acceptable. Uh, but I just thought he did, he put a nice fine point on it. And I, and I included him here because uh, it would be great to hear from him more. I, I think he has a lot to offer and he yeah. pops in every now I and again. And, and that's great. I don't want to actually, I don't want to lose any of these comments. Uh, yeah. I think we should cash them um, in our comment savings account. Um, and use them in our next comment show. Okay, that works for me. Because uh, there's there's some good stuff uh, down the list, and uh, what that means for you is you've already done half your work. Uh, See you later. <laughs> so that. I would have to do all, all more work. Uh, but if there's one that you want to pick out in particular, um, but I I actually I want to give all of these their full due, and I know that we don't have time to do that. Yeah. Let's see. Um, I could really, not really quickly, but it's a short comment. Let me do um, Christianity as useful fiction. Uh, and Aaron, Aaron Burnett, what one of my great, favorite was, oh, guests. What a great, that was such a great show. You guys had great conversational chemistry. Uh, it was a great topic. I thought it was excellent back and forth. Um, you know, and, and so her comment is, I fully acknowledge that Christianity has an awful past. I don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. I still see potential in the teachings of Jesus. And yes, I am a Christian in the sense that Reconstructionist Jews are Jews, even though they reject supernaturalism. So my, my impression and reaction to Erin in general is, God, would it be fantastic if all Christians were like her? Like that, that, that is something to hope for in this world. Um, where I would cross her is, she says, I don't want to throw out the baby with the bathwater. I don't see any reason to call the baby Christianity. The baby can exist without any Christian underpinning or veneer or, or anything like that. I mean, loving your neighbor, helping each other out, you know, giving to the poor. You don't need Christianity for any of these things. So I just the, the thing I quibble with is I don't mind that you call yourself a Christian. But to me, that's you know, you, you might as well be calling yourself, you know, Daniel, you know, or Beelzebub for that matter. So so that's so I if I were going to put the feet to the fire, it would be explain to me why you want to wear this particular label that other people are going to use to inflate their numbers and equivocate on, um, on Christianity's prevalence in the world. Right. She's very much a John Spong, uh, Christian. And, um, yeah, that's my observation too. This is, this is a big tent religion. That's too big. Um, you have too many people, too many factions, all clamoring, for the use of the same name. Uh, and so, you know, Peter often takes me to task um, and says, well, you know, uh, you should say not all Christians, but some Christians uh, believe. And I, and I uh, responded, uh, you know, I'm tired of, I'm done with, um, you know, making, uh, making um, excuses or offering subtitles when I, when I say Christian. I, mm -hmm. Because here's the thing, everyone who calls himself a Christian, they want to be called a Christian. They don't, I, I, I've not met one who wants to be called a progressive Christian. 
Mark Karras did not want to be called a progressive Christian. <laughs> he's, he's extremely progressive. He doesn't want to be called, he wants to be called a Christian. Mm -hmm. Aaron uh, Burnett does not want to be called a progressive. She wants to be called a Christian. Um, uh, what's her? Um, McGraw, McGrew. Um, Lydia, Lydia McGrew. Lydia McGrew uh, doesn't want to be called a conservative Christian. She wants to be called a Christian. It doesn't matter where you are on the spectrum. They all claim Christian. So as a host and as a person who is committed to calling people what they, you know, the, the way they identify themselves, it would be wrong of me to uh, say, you know, offer some kind of um, statement before talk about Christians because they all want to be called Christians. They don't want to be called conservative Christians. Um, they don't want to be called fund fundamentalists. You know, they take offense to funding. <laughs> right. I don't know why. I guess <laughs> well, well done. That's that's a bumper sticker waiting to happen. <laughs> so, um, so, yeah, the tent is too big. Uh, then uh, what you need are different tents. You know, if you if you all are this fractured and you you have such vast chasms of difference uh, in your in your doctrine in your beliefs, uh, then you guys need to work it out <laughs> and you know decide what we're going to call which group, and then we can maybe be more specific. But until then. I'm just going to call you Christians because that's what you all demand to be called. Right. And don't and don't assume that when that that means all everybody broad brush painting. If th this applies to you, right, it, you, you've got to be able to self select yourself out of out of these subgroups if it doesn't apply to what you believe. Right. Uh, look, it, it, Donald, when Donald Trump was president, he was the president of all Americans. Uh, and I know that. There are some people who say, oh, he's not my president. Yes, he is. Right. <laughs> yes, yes, he was. And, uh, you know, when Biden was uh, inaugurated, I know a lot of conservatives uh, who say he's not my president. Yes, he is. You are American. You're not a Trumpist American. You're not a Bidenist American. You are an American. And you're going to have to square with that. Um, and if you don't want to be uh, an American under Biden, you can move to Canada. Uh, that's that's your choice. Uh, you don't have another choice. And for Christians, if you don't want to be lumped in with the fundies or with the um, progressives, then then get another name. Uh, you know, but quit on the one side of your mouth pretending like all Christians are united under this, you know, one big uh, umbrella and we all get along. And then on the other hand, say, yeah, don't lump me in with those people when you're talking about that belief. Yeah, it's having your cake and eat it too. Yeah, so that's that's it for me. That's I'm glad that you brought up um, Aaron because that was uh, frankly my favorite show. It's going to be my favorite show for a long time. I, um, I would love for her to be. I would love to her to be in the message board more frequently, popping in on some of these topics, taking taking some of the heat off of Peter and Brian in these conversations. I think it'll be. I'd re, I would really benefit and enjoy sparring with her in this in this uh, in this space. Yeah. All right, so um, anything else we should cover? I do want to talk about next week's show, the next two weeks' show. Uh, next week, David Russell and myself, there will be no guests. Ooh. Just David Russell and myself. We haven't done uh, too many of those. And we're going to be introducing a topic uh, of epistemology, and this is going to be a two-week uh, series. It may end up being more than that, quite frankly, but week one will be uh, Russell and myself, and we're going to uh, break down in broad strokes uh, the questions and issues regarding epistemology. Week two, we're going to bring out the panel and release the hounds. Uh, we will have uh, a, a three-on-three three panel. I don't know who all is going to be on the show, uh, but uh, that's going to that's going to happen. It may end up being a four-on-four four panel, quite frankly, because I've got a feeling that a lot of people are going to want to <laughs> uh, be a part of that one. Uh, but 
at any rate, it's okay if we have a lot of people because if necessary, we'll do, uh, we'll make it a couple of weeks uh, worth of shows. But uh, once Russell and I have introduced the topic, then the week or two after that, um, we will uh, be breaking it down with a panel of experts and deep thinkers and idiots uh, because we're <laughs> all idiots here. And uh, that's going to be fun. I've been wanting to talk about that for a long time. I've been in some conversation with Andrew uh, on this topic for a while. By the time you hear this podcast, we, we will have been talking about it for a couple of weeks. And you would be surprised at how much there is uh, that we just don't know. This is not going to be one of those bitter shows where everyone's staked out a position uh, and we're just lobbing cannons from, from our um, sides. Uh, there's going to be a lot of, I don't know, this. Uh, it's going to be that kind of show until it isn't. Um, so that said, uh, look forward to that. And uh, if you want to get in touch, it is skepticsandseekers at gmail.com. If you want to uh, get in on the comments, just point your browser to www.skepticsandseekers.squarespace. Dot com. Uh, log into your discuss and then discuss. And uh, I think that's all for now. Anything else, Brian? The only thing I would add is for all you listeners and lurkers who have not yet jumped into the message board, I would love to see you there. Always good to get a variety and uh, new perspectives. So hop on in. The water's warm. Uh, you can be a, a normal idiot like myself and end up being a multi-time uh, podcast guest, so it's not that hard. I yeah, it, no, it's not hard. <laughs> it's not hard at all. Just look <laughs> what we have on the show. It's not hard, <laughs> honestly. So, um, yeah, uh, definitely. If you do want to be on the show, it doesn't matter what you want to talk about. I just want to talk to you. Uh, Skeptics and Seekers uh, at gmail dot com. It's just a matter of scheduling. Uh, you're already approved. You've been pre approved. <laughs> for, for this show uh, and uh, with that uh, have a great week everybody bye bye take care